Lecture 6, here we go. Now I realise that in past weeks my lectures have gone on over the hour mark, which is far too long, so I'm going to try and cut this one back a bit so that you don't have to stifle your yawns at 55 minutes, but we should be in and out of this one in 45. So, Morocco since 1956, a lonely monarchy. Everybody's done the readings, of course. Let's spot the guilty looking faces. Okay, so you haven't all done the readings, but you're going to. Very good. And again, formatting issues with PowerPoint. Us Mac users don't get on very well with Word or Microsoft PowerPoint. Our introduction, though, our, our outline, rather. Introduction will be the past. Nice and simple. These dates are somewhat arbitrary. You know, when we're, we're looking at 50, 60 years plus <coughs> of history, we, we have to pick some uh, era in which to try and cover the material. So I think these are, these are fairly balanced, though, and they do really tell us the story of Morocco since independence up till the present day. Part one, then, in this evening's lecture will be finding a role where Morocco found itself upon independence. Part two, war and cold peace, which obviously is going to focus very much on the issues with Western Sahara, which are ongoing and far from settled. And part three, a modern monarchy, question mark. And conclusion, we will have a brief look at the future of Morocco. So, the walrus and the carpenter, what's the relevance, I hear you ask? Are they in Morocco? Are they in Morocco? They could be, they could be, could, they could be. This is the verse. Let me stand aside so we can all see it. Or at least it's part of the verse. The time has come, the walrus said, to talk of many things, of shoes and ships and sealing wax, of cabbages and kings. So what's the, what's the immediate relevance then to Morocco? The kings. the kings, thank you. There is a great deal more to it than that. Um, cabbages. What do we know about Morocco? What's the main industry in Morocco? Agriculture. agriculture. What do we need for agriculture in the modern world? Water. And? Farmers. Farmers, very good. We didn't ever get the farmers. <laughs> That's a very good point. <laughs> what makes things grow bigger, faster? Fertilizer, Fertilizer a.k.a. Phosphate. Phosphates. The phosphates. You see, you see what we're doing with this now? I'm trying to make you think. I'm sorry for the imposition, but that's what we're here for. The shoes, ships, and sealing wax we will also deal with. Don't worry. It's all relevant. And I get to throw up a Lewis Carroll verse, which is always fun. So here we are. For those of you who know your US states, Morocco is slightly larger than California. You remember that from last week? Algeria, superimposed on the contiguous 48 states. Have that in your mind. It's like one of those, get that burning on your retinas, and that's Morocco by comparison. So it's not an insubstantial country. The only country, of course, in North Africa with an Atlantic coastline, which is relevant to where it looks in the world, which direction it decides to look in, and, and conversely not look in. Slightly larger than California, and not dissimilar in size if we tipped it and pushed it up there, like a seahorse or a dolphin, perhaps, turning its head. Um, I'm not going to do a lot of deep history, but this is always of interest, I think, for um, particularly American listeners, that Morocco was the first country in the world to recognize the United States as an independent country. And Morocco, indeed, was the first country to receive uh, American diplomats under um, George Washington. The first diplomat sent overseas went to Morocco. So I think it's important. Maybe it's not as important as you might think, but there's a continuous line from uh, December 1777 until our own time. Very close military relations still between the US and America. And this, uh, that's Rue d'Amérique. This is uh, not terribly clear, perhaps, the street sign in Tangier. And it's called Rue d'Amérique because this is the original consulate building that's in Tangier. Still there. It's now a museum of uh, Americans in Morocco. So if you're ever in Tangier, it's well worth a visit. Um, how many here present have been to Morocco? One, two, three. Three? Any advance? Three of you. How many of you planning to go to Morocco? One, two, three, four. Yeah, go on. Everybody should plan to go to Morocco. It's a <laughs> wonderful place. Great food, nice people. Lots to see. Um, I'm very fond of Tangier up here. It's a very 
strange place. We'll talk about its international status that it, it had through the 1920s and 30s in a minute. But right <coughs> up alongside the Strait of Gibraltar, it's more Spanish up here than anything else. But the whole of the country is a wonderful <coughs> mix of, of the European, of the African, of the Arab, of the Berber. Um, again, rather like departments and universities clashing about what's in the Middle East and what's in Africa. You can throw in the Atlantic element here and the European element. It's an enormous Venn diagram and everything crosses over Morocco and it has all these wonderful strands running through it. The only town I will highlight now is Tendouf. I'm sure you've all heard of this. Central to the whole problem with Western Sahara because that's where between 50,000 and 200,000 uh, Sahrawi uh, refugees are living. It sounds a bit vague to say 50,000 to 200,000. Well, those... Uh, the, the government in exile of Western Sahara, shall we say, uh, put the estimate at 200,000. The Moroccan government put it at 50,000. Uh, the US and other international observers put it somewhere in the middle, around 100,000. We're not quite sure. Um, you can go to Google Maps these days, though, and get a pretty accurate idea of the size of Tindouf and the size of the camps that are there. And here we are from space looking down. Morocco, of all the countries in North Africa, by far has the largest green bits when seen from um, space. Uh, Egypt has the Delta, of course, and the Nile Valley. But in Morocco, you have very, very fertile country right up to the, the northern coast there. Um, this is the international border right down the bottom here. And then it comes up. And these, obviously, are the Hyatlas Mountains, snow-capped at times. And... Um, Algeria, obviously, to its east. Which border remains closed since... Anybody? When did the border between Morocco and Algeria close? 1994. Very good place. Why does Morocco stand apart in the region? Of all the countries we're looking at, we have, we have unique points for each of them. Because they're closest to the Strait of Gibraltar. Closest to Europe, thank you. The only monarchy. The only monarchy, thank you. Some would say the best food. The point I will highlight, though, is that it is the sole monarchy in North Africa. I think its, it's closeness to Europe is also very central, though, very important. Uh, the ruling family have been in place since when, does anybody know? And does anybody know the name of the ruling family? I've been reading about them all week. The yeah, Alawis. Thank you. Alawi, or Alawite. From 1631, my slide isn't broken, and I know we, we used to sort of, we, we pointed and mocked Colonel Gaddafi's green flag for Libya, but this was the flag of Morocco from 1631. The Alawi had this plain red banner. It's obviously um, come out of the, the medieval period when it was used as a war standard, so a plain red flag is nice and easy to spot. So that was the uh, flag for the royal dynasty, the Alawi, who have ruled Morocco since 1631. Just a quick bit for the Arabists in the room, and for those of you who should know Arabic but don't yet, those of you whose ambition is to learn to speak Arabic. Maghreb, al-Maghreb, just means the West in Arabic. Nothing more, nothing less. We talk about North, East, South, and West. Al-Maghreb, the West. So, Al-Mamlakat Al-Maghrabiya, the Kingdom of Morocco. We use the Kingdom of the West, or the farthest West, to describe Morocco. I say we, um, I should really say that Arabic historians, traditionally, and geographers have used these three terms. Al-Maghreb Al-Aqsa, the farthest West. Al-Maghreb Al-Awsat, for the Middle West, which stood for Algeria. And finally, Al-Maghreb Al-Adna, the nearest west, which stood for Tunisia. So they're the three western provinces, that is, west of Egypt. Anybody inspired to learn Arabic? It's easy, isn't it, you see? Same words, just put them together with other words. That's all you do with languages. So since 1915, the Moroccans, the, the ruling dynasty, came up with this wheeze of having a green pentagram on top of the red standard, and that's the flag today. It's actually, uh, in terms of flags, I think, it looks pretty cool. Put a pentagram on a flag and, and you're onto something. And this is what they've got. Other people have the same <coughs> idea. Can anybody tell me, please, what those flags stand for? French colonials or 
morning, it was that it was an administration or something. Yep. It's the French protectorate enzyme. So this was the, the flag used by the French. They weren't the ruling authorities, but when they had the protectorate of Morocco, this was theirs with the French tricolor up here. This one, anybody want to hazard a guess? If it's not the French, it might be the... Thank you. This was the civilian ensign used by the Spanish when they had the northernmost stretch of Morocco along that Mediterranean coast and the deep south of Morocco, the bits that we now think of as Western Sahara. And this rather elaborate concoction here was for the international city of Tangier. Um, I'm sure you've all heard of, if not seen, the film Casablanca. Casablanca was originally set in Tangier. Um, the screenplay was set in Tangier, and it was to reflect the, the, the very international status of the city and the fact that it was a hotbed for things like smuggling and, um, well, all, all the bad stuff that went on in the film that we so romanticized. And this was their flag, which showed the international status. Um, Spain was, of course, um, nominally neutral during the Second World War, but occupied international city of Tangier. Um, they said to stop others doing the same. But that's another bit of fallout from the past. I hope this is clear enough. The bright red bits, Spain at the top, obviously, and then Spanish um, Morocco, as was. The green bit was the French protectorate. This was Spanish as well at the top. You see these cities here? Still Spanish enclaves to this day. And Tangier there, as I mentioned, which was an international zone. I know you've all done the readings, but just, just to have a look at that map for a second, you can see the problem when one of the two protectorate nations, that is Spain, decides to leave before the other. The Moroccans see this as an opportunity to develop what they have historically claimed was Greater Morocco. It's very, very easy just to sweep south. I'll mention it now in case we don't get to it later, but Western Sahara is owed a referendum. It was promised one in 1991 by the United Nations. It's unlikely ever to take place now. Um, I think that any peace plan of the future will have a different setup and come from a different place. But the argument that the Moroccans make is that Western Sahara has never existed as a country insofar as it's never had a central government that they could say, we are the country of Western Sahara. By the same token, though, one could argue that Morocco has never occupied Western Sahara or governed it in any sense like a modern nation state would. So what's uh, six of one is half a dozen of the other. It just depends which side of this argument we, we look at. So finding a role. After independence, who would rule? Can we cast our minds back just for a second to Egypt, to Libya? to Tunisia, and to Algeria. Have you got those names going through your head now? Of what happened immediately after independence? Do we remember who took power, how, and why? The rise of nationalism was very important, both before the Second World War, through the Second World War, and then obviously in the post-war period. So in Morocco, it was a very similar situation. There were different contenders for who would rule um, any independent nation of Morocco. We know it as the Kingdom of Morocco, but of course that wasn't set at the time before independence. So the Sultan, Mohammed V, grandfather of the current king, Mohammed VI, was at the head, as we've said, of the Alawi dynasty, which was in place since 1631. This did not mean, however that upon independence, rule of the country would be handed necessarily on a plate to the royal family. The Istiklal party were the main nationalists, um, more or less secular, should we say, for the sake of argument, but they were a nationalist political party. Can anybody tell me, please, what does Istiklal mean? If you'd all done your reading, you should know. Independence. Hmm? Independence. Independence, thank you. Um, yeah, it's not a particularly clever party political name, but it's certainly got the message across. We're a nationalist party, we call ourselves Independence Party. As I say, it got the message over. They were very well organised. 
but primarily their support came, as in other parts of North Africa, from the more educated and the more urban branches of society. The king, the monarchy, was more popular in the rural areas, in the less well-developed areas, in the poorer areas, and also one should point out, although we're not going to look at Berber politics tonight, the king was always more popular among the Berber population. The Stiklal, the nationalists, were always more popular among those who self-identified as Arabs. Not that the two categories can be divided absolutely, but if one self-identifies as Arab, one was more likely to look to the Nationalist Party, and if one self-identified as Berber, you were more likely to be a supporter of the monarchy. So there are these two groups. They both had a role to play in the independent struggle, and both assumed that they would naturally be in power upon independence. Um, is it a good thing to assume? Anybody know the Moscow Rules? Moscow Rules? Of, of, of any good spy novel has the Moscow Rules. The first rule is never assume. And they say it's because it makes an ass of you and me. So both sides assumed they would be in power. Uh, only one could win out. Morocco and Tunisia, let's think about those two countries now that we've moved west and we're on our last of the five top row nations. What happened in Tunisia after independence? Is it a monarchy? No, the bay was overthrown. The bay was overthrown. B-E-Y, of course, for those who are still struggling with the homonyms. The bay was overthrown in favour of a party political system. In Morocco, obviously, the case is reversed. This was not the first king. We mentioned Sultan Mohammed V, who, a year after independence, retitled himself king. Um, this was his son, Hassan II, reigned from 1961 to 1999. I've skipped Mohammed V simply because a lot more happened under Hassan, and, and we need to move on. In terms of finding a role, it was this man who pushed through the identity of Morocco it wasn't until 1862, independence granted in um, 1956, 1962, we have a constitution. That's a hell of a gap. You see the trouble in Egypt today, where people are arguing, and indeed in Tunisia. Um, the parliament which exists in Tunisia today <coughs> was not a parliament that people voted in to rule the country. It was voted in to settle a constitution. Well, that still has yet to be done. And you can see the trouble in Egypt two years on when there's no agreed constitution. Or if one party seemed to be dominating the fight over what the constitution will look like. It was the same situation in Morocco after independence, except the struggle took six years. So the 18th of November, the first Moroccan constitution ever is implemented. 18th of November was a significant date in modern Moroccan history. Anybody tell me why? Think back seven years from 1962. We get to 1955, the year before independence. It was on the 18th of November 1955 that Sultan Mohammed V returned to Morocco. The French, seeing him as a figurehead around whom the people were, were backing this call for independence, exiled him. He moved around a bit, but most of his exile was spent in Madagascar. Um, I've never been to Madagascar, and I'm sure it's a lovely place, but the king was keen to get home. And he returned on that date, the 18th of November, 1955. So when the constitution is implemented under Sultan Mohammed V's son, Hassan II, you can see that by using this date, he's sending out a very clear message that there is a link between my father and me and ownership, if you like, of the country. If that date was too subtle for those who didn't know their Moroccan history... Um, it, the Constitution also put him in as Prime Minister, Minister of Defence, Minister of the Interior, Minister of Agriculture, and made him inviolate and above criticism on punishment of imprisonment for life. So I think it's pretty clear that the message the King was sending out it was, I'm in charge, this is my country. So this is the big question, this is the burning question that you all want answered. How did Hassan II outmanoeuvre the nationalist political parties? We've mentioned some of this already. There was a population largely loyal to the king. Even the nationalists were split on, the, on this subject. Istiklal was not a monolithic entity that demanded the removal of the king. 
Um, many members of Istiklal would have been happy to have the king remain in place as a figurehead, as a ceremonial character, a bit like the queen um, in Great Britain uh, today. But the king, or the monarchy, I should say, the ruling family, was seen as central, or at least they put themselves as being central to the granting of independence. If you think about the French, they long since got rid of their kings and queens, so they really couldn't care less whether there was a king in Morocco or not. But for the Moroccan people, it was important. <clears throat> the use of rural and Berber organizations. Somebody asked me um, a couple of weeks ago about uh, Berber politics, and I did say that we will deal with the Berber um, in week nine, I think it is, the lecture on politics. So hold on for that. Berber politics will be discussed. The king was also very smart. Um, that is Hassan II. He was definitely more of a political player than his father, Mohammed V. The king and those who advised him saw these <coughs> fissures appearing among the nationalist political parties, and he fostered these very, very easily, simply by offering somebody a position in his government. Suddenly, there's a rallying point. The party split becomes even greater. To form a political party at this time in Morocco, permission had to come from the center as well. So the king was only too happy to grant permission for um, any political party which would split the support for the Istiklal nationalists. So after the constitution, Morocco has its first parliament. It lasts just three years before it's got rid of it was weak, it was divided. The king was able to point to it and say, look, this is what you get for democracy. It's unstable, it's doing nothing for the economy of the country. What can I do? I've given you a parliament and, and you've, you've, not, you've not seized the opportunity. By 1965, there, were wide, there was widespread rioting across uh, Morocco, mainly in Casablanca, or at least it started in Casablanca and spread to other industrial centers. But for the king, this was perfect. This was perfect. As I say, he was able to abolish this, or not abolish rather, but overturn the first parliamentary session and rule with an even heavier hand than had been the case previously. What's the capital of Morocco? Rabat. Rabat. How long has it been the capital for? Follow-up questions are always more difficult, aren't they? The ancient capital of Morocco, and this is, this is a very brief aside, but it's an interesting one just for, for huge sweeps of history. The ancient capital of Morocco was Tangier, that international city so close to Europe, on the water. Phoenicians came there, the Romans came through there. When the Arab invasions took place in the 7th century, the Arabs, being a desert people, not used to seafaring in their early days at least, built a new capital at Fez. For centuries, Fez was the capital um, I'm going to take the digression just one degree further. In Egypt, the capital for 800 years was Alexandria. When the Arabs arrive, they make Fustat the capital, which is now Old Cairo. When they arrive in Ifraqiya, Tunisia, the capital had been Carthage. They moved it to Kairouan. In each of these major Arab provinces of North Africa, the Arabs took the capital away from the water and moved it inland where they felt more secure. They took it into the desert areas. That's what Arabs knew better than seafaring. When the French came in to Morocco, the capital was moved to Rabat, on the coast. This was something that the French preferred to a capital inland. The role of religion in Morocco is very different to that in other countries of North Africa. <coughs> You've heard the term Sharif, as in I shot the Sharif, no. Um, the Sharif means a descendant of uh, the Prophet Muhammad in the Islamic religion. Actually, the words are related. We do get the word Sharif from Sharif, but that's another story for another day. Another reason for you all to learn Arabic. So as a Sharifian, or a direct descendant of Muhammad, whether or not he was, it doesn't matter. He, they certainly advertise themselves as a family as being descended from the Prophet, and that's important. The truth is not nearly always as important as perception or image of the truth. So in this case, you have to go with the story that the king was keen to show himself as a defender of the faith. In other countries in North Africa, we've seen the problems that have arisen when Islamist parties try and take control. 
they've been excluded politically, they fight back. You have moderate Islamist opposition, it becomes radicalized. In Morocco, the king tried to dispel all of these problems by claiming the religion for himself. In Libya, I think we mentioned that one of the reasons that the Islamist parties didn't do very well post-independence elections was because all the parties were, to a degree, Islamist. So it's no good you coming along waving the Quran at me. I'm also an Islamist. It's just that that's not the platform upon which I stand. So you can see how here the king could pull the rug out from under any parties gathering around an Islamist claim. I'm descended from the Prophet. Who do you think you are? That's the... It's very important in Morocco and unique in North Africa. That said, in 1970 there was a coup attempt against the king, led by the army, or elements of the army, I should say. And in 1971, a second coup attempt was led by elements of the air force. In terms of stories, the 1971 coup is the better, definitely the more filmic version. The king is flying back to the capital from an overseas visit. The plane is due to land. Suddenly it's intercepted by jets from the Royal Moroccan Air Force that fire upon the plane. There is gunfire. The king, understanding what's happening, he was a paranoid individual and understood that people wanted to revolt and overthrow him, rushed to the cockpit and pretended to be communicating to say, the king is dead. The message went to the fighters. They called off their attack. The plane landed safely. Um... And that was basically the first part of the story. The plane wasn't shot down because the, um, the, the uh, hijacking planes, if you like, the jets, thought they had already done the job of killing the king through some random shot fired through the fuselage. Um, but it was the king's action, which apparently is recorded, so we have, we have undeniable, incontrovertible evidence that that was the king's quick thinking by seizing the radio that saved the day, at uh, least for the king. A number of those people uh, guilty of plotting the coup, spent 20 years plus in prison. Many other people disappeared. Um, Very often when we read about Latin American politics, Argentina, Chile, we think about the disappeared. Nicaragua, another place in the 70s and 80s where we talk about the disappeared of politics. It happened plenty in Morocco too. Um, There's a period in Moroccan history called the lead years where there was no progress. It was heavy. And... We will never know, I would argue, we will never know how many thousands disappeared. Um, There's a lot of desert in North Africa. It's very easy for people to disappear. And the Atlantic is on their doorstep too. So these were no benign monarchs. And I think that's also very important. When When we come up to the present day even, we see the concessions perhaps that the younger king, Mohammed VI, is making to the people. When compared with his father particularly the last decade of the father's reign, the 90s, um, people love Muhammad VI because the father was um, strong-armed as a monarch. Let's put it gently like that, shall we? Rather than be sued for libel. No, he can't. He's dead. I can't be sued, can I? Anyway, let's move on to the war and cold peace. 1975 to 1999. I'm going to stand aside so you can see these three versions of... The maps. Are they clear enough? Can you read the text? So on the left, just green, Morocco shown separate from Western Sahara, with the white block obviously being Western Sahara. Here, showing the Western Sahara connected. This is how Morocco sees it. I mean, they still refer to it just as Morocco, not Greater Morocco anymore. You're not allowed to fly the flag of Western Sahara in Morocco or indeed in those bits of Western Sahara that are occupied. Why does Morocco want to hold on to Western Sahara so badly? For the phosphates. We talk about Greater Morocco and and it's very easy, of course, in any country anywhere in the world to rile up degrees of your population with the cry of nationalism. Um... Nationalism, yes. Somebody once said of nationalism, it's the last resort of the scoundrel. But uh, there we are. It's very easy to get people interested if they believe their country is at threat, even if their country is, in the case of Western Sahara, arguably um, a disputed country. But it's for phosphates. It's for power financially rather than physically. It's desert. There's nothing there apart from what's under the ground. But what's under the ground (coughs) is vital. And it will be even increasingly uh, important in the next five to ten decades, 50 to 100 years from now, 
phosphates will be the new gold standard. So in 1975, this is the, the legal stuff, the first entry here. In May, the United Nations mission goes to visit Morocco and Western Sahara, and the result of the UN mission is the report which says there is overwhelming consensus for Sahrawi independence and the Polisario Front as the country's leading political force. So in 1975 in May, there was no question that the people of the region did not want to be, did not consider themselves Moroccan. <laughs> So in November, Morocco launches the Green March, so-called, capital G, capital M, and occupies parts of Western Sahara. Obviously, it occupies the northernmost bits first, those adjoining Morocco proper. The Spanish, as you know, have pulled out of Western Sahara at this time, and the Green March is the moment when they, the Moroccans move in to fill the vacuum left by Spanish withdrawal. Um, I don't think, I'm not sure, actually, maybe there is. Is there a building in D.C. from which this flag flies? I don't know if the Western Sahara has a representation in D.C. You know, I think I was walking by yesterday and I saw one, but it didn't have the um, crescent. So I don't know. Without the crescent, what's the flag? Iraq. Hmm? Iraq. Mm -hmm. Kuwait. I'm just going to say Palestine in those, in those colored orders. But, um, they do get rather confusing, don't they, when, when, when so many countries use the same four colors and reverse them around. Um, I was showing, uh, where's earlier, I printed off an invitation today, and it had cross flags on the top, um, the Union flag of Great Britain and, and the American flag, and whatever happened, the picture was fine. When I clicked print, all of the red came out as blue and all the blue came out as red. It's very confusing when you, when you see a flag in all the wrong colour orders. So anyway, for those of you who didn't know, Polisario stands for the Popular Front for the Liberation of Saguia El Hamra and Rio de Oro. You know where those territories are, of course? More or less there. There are three bits to Western Sahara proper. Uh, right here, Cap Juby was the French name, covers the topmost strand. Um, arguably the most Moroccan, it being closest, and, and there's not the same level of outrage for Moroccan occupation of that one, could argue. But these two other districts, like Ria El Hamra and Rio de Oro in the deep, deep south, there is no question, uh, historically, that these were not Moroccan territories per se. Yes, they had trade relations. Yes, sometimes they were under the tutelage of the Moroccan dynasties, but never never occupied or ruled directly. So this was the Green March. Here yeah, they set off in a beautifully <coughs> staged event captured here by Magnum Photos um, with their lovely red flags marching into the desert. 350,000 plus, some say as many as half a million civilians set off south across the Moroccan border into Western Sahara. It was not entirely a civilian march. There were troops involved. They didn't have any heavy armour, but the message was clear that they were coming to occupy and nobody was going to stand in their way. Well, they were right, because the Spanish were rushing home. They certainly weren't, weren't going to go to a war over a bit of desert they were willingly giving up. There were at least 20,000 troops present for this march and vehicles. So there was no question among the very um, thinly populated parts of the desert um, among the Western Sahrawi, that they could put up any sort of fight. The Polisario, as we saw, was founded in 1973, and they were initially, I suppose, a lobbying organization. They were obviously nationalist. They were very left-wing, which is another reason that the right-wing monarchy of Morocco was against them. And they were supported, of course, and still are to this day, by the left-wing government in Algeria. This is important for regional politics generally. Um, the, the title of the lecture, Lonely Monarchy, is relevant, I think, as well, because the, the Moroccans have often been accused by other um, North African and, and uh, wider Arab nations as being reactionary, just because they are um, a monarchy, maybe with some justification. So this is the story in outline. 1976. 
Spanish mandate ends in the region. The only thing that Spain didn't give up were those enclaves in the far, far north of Morocco, which still exist. And which, if you go there today, rather oddly, do feel exactly like bits of Europe with high fences around them, though. Any Moroccans who can get over those fences and land in Melilla, for example, um, are in Europe. It's quite that simple. But this bit, they didn't want. What was happening in Spain at this time? Can anybody tell me? The end of Franco. Yes, Generalissimo Franco. He seems like a name from deep, deep history. When we think about the Spanish Civil War um, that ran up to 1938, you know, we forget that Franco remained in power until 76. He was ailing in 75. Um, but yeah, he's still relevant. His name is important here. With his end, there was no keenness in Spain to hold on to the territory. It's one of the reasons, one of many reasons, that they were happy to get rid of it. Now, Mauritania co-occupied different bits of Western Sahara. Spain had the coastal parts. Morocco naturally had the bits that were adjoining... Um, did I say Morocco? I meant Mauritania had the bits that were abutting their nation of Western Sahara. The Mauritanians had, still have, a very small army... But in the late 1970s, they were obviously no match for the, the Moroccan army, which even by this time was very heavily funded by America. So the Mauritanians withdrew all claim to the area. And then the Moroccans do something which stopped the raiding tactics of the Western Saharis. The, the uh, Polisario had been using guerrilla tactics, hit and run, fast moving vehicles. So the Moroccans built an enormous wall of sand. There was plenty of sand down there. So they put up this berm, the sand berm. And this, this rather elaborate and complicated looking map is, as you know, all the slides will be put up tomorrow. So do feel free to have a closer look at this at your leisure, because it's very telling. This is how they extended the berm. I mean, remember that uh, Morocco proper is slightly larger than California. Western Sahara, which starts here and comes down to here, that is two-thirds the size of California, and not dissimilar in size. So these are the walls. One, two, three, four, five, six. First wall. I mean, these are vast structures. Um, nobody has yet accurately calculated the amount of money the Moroccans have spent building a wall to keep the Sahrawi out of their own territory, just so they have access to the phosphate mines, at least on this side of the wall. The berm now comes all the way down here. Imagine building a wall of sand around California. Boy, <coughs> solve unemployment problems <laughs> overnight. Um, and today it's still policed. Um, estimates range between 50 and 70% of the Moroccan forces are used just to keep an eye on that wall, on the sand berm. I mean, there's, there's money in those phosphates, but there was talk some years ago of uh, Morocco and the Western Sahrawi coming to a deal whereby they would split the profits from the phosphate mining. It, it would certainly save the Moroccans a great deal of money and effort in trying to um, patrol this desert the size of California. But there we are. Oh, this is not the reason why, I suppose. And up here we have Tindouf, as seen on an earlier map, headquarters of the Polisario in Algeria, where it remains safe from Moroccan interference. Because the Moroccans, however much they dislike the Algerians, are not keen to go to war with them. Um, United Nations mission. Somebody was interested in those. I think it might have been Sarah and Wes. Um, this United Nations mission. Has it been a complete failure or has it been a partial success? Well, in terms of cost effectiveness, it's been a massive failure. Because it was set up in 1991, making it one of the oldest, longest running United Nations missions in the world. However, the fact that since the ceasefire between the Moroccans and Western Sahara in 1991, there has been peace, in inverted commas, between the two sides, arguably it's been a success. But at what cost? Um, apart from the 50 to 70 percent of the Moroccan army that patrol that sand berm, um, the United Nations mission, MINURSO, has 400 observers based in and along Western Sahara's borders. Um, 200 of them in uniform and the other 200 out of uniform, civilian observers. So there are 400 people that national governments are paying for, who I'm sure are terribly bored <laughs> looking through their binoculars at the Moroccans, looking back at them through their binoculars. 
But there we are. 1991, a referendum was promised on the future of the country, and that referendum has yet to take place. Uh, Morocco has been busy repopulating Western Sahara with Moroccans, so that when a referendum does take place, they can be more certain of the result. There's nothing worse than having an election if you don't know the outcome beforehand, and the Moroccans have learned that lesson very well. The ceasefire remains in place. Very briefly for this period as well, Hassan II forged closer and closer ties with the West. I'm just using um, American examples because I think they are most they're closest to home, perhaps. But this is uh, President Reagan with King Hassan II. Military aid to Morocco is not as much as it was in previous decades. I suppose that's because um, America's feeling the budget pinch at the moment. But certainly in terms of training exercises um, and, and closeness, sharing of technology and information, since 2001, those ties have been uh, very tight. Morocco, apart from the terrorist attacks in Casablanca in 2003, is seen as a stable, Islamist-free, largely Islamist-free country, certainly when compared to Algeria, Libya, Tunisia and Egypt, the other four countries in our area of interest. And indeed, Bill Clinton went in person to uh, Hassan II's funeral in 1999. It's surprising sometimes when one goes to get images for these lectures, how you can't get anything of a high quality. There's this one photograph of Bill Clinton at the funeral. It strikes me as odd that somebody took one picture as though it was pre-digital days and, and they were sort of watching their budget on film. But I'm sorry if he looks a bit blurry. That is him at the funeral, trust me. So they might be very popular with the West. Western-looking. Western-looking Morocco. Literally, of course, with its position in the Maghreb, on the West. But also politically. I haven't dwelt on it tonight because time, alas, is against us. But don't forget, in any of these histories since independence, the importance of the Cold War. We've already looked more closely, I think, at the Cold War history of the other nations in North Africa. So at this stage, suffice to say, Morocco was on our side as opposed to the others who were more Soviet-leaning. So the ties have been very long and tight. What's this flag? You will not see this flag in DC. Not hanging from a building, anyway. I mean, we're in D.C. and you can see the flag. You take my point. Um, here it is. It's the flag for... You're going to kick yourselves when I tell you. It's an organisation, not a country, if that helps. Hmm? Yes. No? The organisation of the Maghreb? Yeah. yeah. The whatever the Maghreb Union? Whatever. That's what we call it. The whatever union <laughs> of the Maghreb. <laughs> it's the flag for the Arab Maghreb Union. Thank you. Yeah, yes, the A.M.U. Like a decade. <laughs> The, the Arab Maghreb Union. This is their flag. It's a rather attractive flag, actually, with the five stars, one for each of the five member states, um, at least two of whom aren't speaking to each other, so they could easily drop one of those stars and uh, be done with it. Morocco is also significant in terms of international organisations. How many Africanists here? <laughs> What's the most important, arguably the most important international organization for the continent of Africa? African Union, AU. Morocco is the only African nation that isn't a member. It withdrew in 1984 because of the dispute with Western Sahara and Morocco, which is an important country. I mean, arguably, it's, it's an economic powerhouse in North African terms. But since 1984, it has not been. It's the only member to voluntarily withdraw from the African Union. I believe there are two other nations who are currently suspended from membership of the African Union. Um, answers on a postcard. Uh, but in the case of Morocco, it's the only country to withdraw. It doesn't really get on with many of its neighbours. And it's those phosphates again coming into play. <laughs> a modern monarchy. I'm very much looking forward to the seminar, by the way, after the break. Um, Sean and Wes have put together some very interesting questions, some of which will um, allow me to skip lightly over some of these, these more modern pieces, because we're going to look after the break at this question of the monarchy today. 
a modern monarchy. I, I didn't realise, actually, until I just put this photograph up, that, you know, national costume often makes one look less, perhaps, modern than it might. It's very interesting when you're in Saudi Arabia or other parts of the Gulf to watch uh, two or more men on television discussing the soccer match that's been on that evening, and they're wearing their the white phobes and, and the headgear. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a lovely contrast between what is seen as traditional costume, which has become more popular over the years when uh, watching things like sports. So this is the king today. Well, actually, last November, November 2011, Mohammed VI, not his given name. He took Mohammed VI in honor of his grandfather when he came to the throne in 1999. Born in 1963. This is the state of Morocco today, politically at least. Morocco was one of those countries that, in light of the so-called Arab Spring, people say, why not Morocco? Why hasn't it happened there? Well, what hasn't happened there? Okay, the government hasn't been overthrown. True. The royal family remain in place. True. Has there been an absence of protests? No. Have there been self-immolations? Yes. Interestingly, in Morocco, it's the only country, as far as I'm aware, and if anybody has evidence to the contrary, please tell me, because I'd, I'd love to know. Morocco is the only country where service members, that is, at least three members of the army, have self-immolated in protests whilst in uniform. It's significant because the army is a branch or under the direct control of the king. And I think anybody that chooses to keep their uniform on before they commit suicide in this very dramatic fashion is definitely sending a signal about patronage and who's in charge of what in the country. So there have been mass protests in Morocco. There um, have been self-immolations. The protests perhaps haven't been as numerous as they have been in Algeria, where there have been literally thousands of protests. But still, they haven't finished yet. I think the 2003 terrorist attacks in Casablanca really shook up the country, though, because while Moroccans might want to see change... Some of them obviously want to get rid of the king, but by no means the majority. They still are a country that values their stability, and they look east to the country of Algeria, and they see the civil war that took place throughout the uh, 90s with inevitable horror. They don't want it to happen there. So the referendum in 2011 was King Mohammed VI's attempt to say, OK, I've heard you. I understand there's this Arab uprising thing going on. Let's implement significant changes. So they've, they've done it on paper. It's yet to be realized. Um, if any of you have Google Alerts set up and you're interested in Morocco, you will notice in the past year that um, every other week there's another journalist being arrested for defamation. And by defamation or insulting the monarchy or even being a threat to... Uh, They'd be charged with treason, a threat to national security, and attacks against Islam. This will include newspaper editors writing stories about um, members of the Moroccan parliament using their expense accounts to buy champagne. That is considered an attack on state security, and you can get 12 months or more in prison. So this is post-Arab Spring. This is the new enlightened Morocco, where editors are still jailed for writing the truth. Berber rights are improving in Morocco. Arguably, they had a very long way to come. Remember, at independence, Berber rights were very important to the king. They're far less important now. I think these, these divisions between Berber and Arab populations and who supports the monarchy have faded over time. Sahrawi rights, obviously, completely ignored. As I mentioned earlier, I believe, illegal to fly the flag anywhere inside Morocco or in occupied Western Sahara. And opposition parties are tolerated because they are emasculated. It's going right back to um, independence and this idea that you will allow opposition parties to grow because um, you can split the vote. So while the uh, moderate, so-called moderate Islamist parties might have um, a large number of seats in Parliament at the moment, they're no threat to the status quo because the king will never allow a majority to challenge his authority. Population stats, love our population stats. I'll step aside so that you can see the bottom line there. 30% of today's population 
of 14 or younger. That's the headline figure. So why is it at the bottom? No, it's the headline figure at the bottom of the page. Does that make sense? Um, if you look at your figures from last week, the, the population of Morocco and Algeria is quite similar. Obviously, Algeria is a lot bigger in size, but <coughs> Morocco hasn't had the same problems of, of mass unemployment as the Algerians have had, or at least they don't today. 10% of the official nationwide figure for unemployment today. It has been up as high as 30%, um, estimated at 30% in 1989, 1990. It has been dropping steadily. Tourism, responsible for 20% of Morocco's GDP, that tailed off enormously after 2003. It's largely um, Western European tourists as well, very easy to get to, obviously. Um, Americans, not so much. 16% of total exports, fishing industry. Now, this is, this is interesting, because this is where Morocco finds itself very often on a collision course with the um, <coughs> European Union. Um, I know it seems like a very, very long way from cold, dreary England and cold, dreary Ireland to sunny Spain and sunny Morocco, but fishermen from the British Isles go down to fish in, let's say they're not Moroccan waters because they're delineated in a certain way, but there are fishing disputes every year in European courts with British fishermen, French, Spanish, and it leads to trade disputes which are damaging to the Moroccans. It's just not as easy for Morocco to import and export with America as it would be to Europe. So they have to be very careful about these sensitive issues of fishing. Because those who go fishing, whether they're Moroccan, Spanish or British, tend not to be the wealthiest segments of your society. They're a segment where if you lose fishing jobs, they're not going to get employment easily in another sector. So each one of these countries are very keen to protect things like fishing rights and agricultural rights. But it's the fishing one, obviously, where you bang up against other nations very easily. Latest American estimate for the phosphate reserves is 85% of the global total. The Moroccans claim they have 75% of the global total. Let's split the difference on that figure. It's a vast reserve of phosphates. Does that count Western Sahara? Does not, count, does not include Western Sahara. That excludes Western Sahara. To be fair, um, I, I hate to be fair when I'm talking about occupying another country, but in fairness... The larger reserves uh, that we know about, proven reserves, are by far and away in Morocco. It's not to say that the reserves in Western Sahara are insignificant by any means, but when we're looking at 85 or 80 percent of the, the global totals, the, the, these are vast sums. But yes, it is excluding Western Sahara. <coughs> and today, then, this modern monarchy, this modern monarchy, this progressive, uh, constitutionally reforming-minded king, where have we got to? Um, this is going to be Sarah's topic, isn't it? It's not one of you lot. The Manhasset negotiations. A pity she's not here. Um, first direct talks between the governments of uh, Morocco and the government in exile of Western Sahara. Uh, Manhasset is not a place in Morocco you've never heard of. It's in New York. Um, so don't get confused and think I'm sending you on a wild goose chase. Like, this is in New York State. Uh, 2007 8 negotiations between the two sides, which were positive. Um, if for no other reason than that they were taking place after a, a break of seven years. I think that the Polisario, the government in exile of Western Sahara, knows that the referendum isn't going to take place anytime soon. They've been waiting since 1991 without result. I think they are slowly understanding that there are other ways of getting what they want. And I think it will be... I don't believe they're going to get total independence in the next couple of decades... I think the most likely scenario is a high degree of autonomy in some sort of federation with Morocco. And this is something which was being discussed at Manhasset. Um, Algeria and Mauritania were also present. Now, this was very positive because, as I mentioned, the border with uh, Morocco and Algeria remains closed since 1994. This is a nightmare for the region. It's, it's why nobody recognized the flag of the AMU and why you were right to point out, well, they haven't been talking to each other for decades. What's the point of a regional economic um, alliance if, if the main parties, the biggest economies, won't talk to each other? And there's the cost. Um, it's, it's always about economics, I suppose, at the end of the day, isn't it? 50% of Morocco's defence budget, virtually, it's been reckoned by some estimates, 
Every penny the Moroccans have taken out of Western Sahara in phosphates, they've spent on defending it. So, I don't know. You don't have to be the world's smartest economist to think about re-evaluating where your interests lie. Something else that uh, we haven't looked at yet, and I'll just mention very briefly, uh, Morocco doesn't have large reserves of oil and gas, unlike Algeria and Libya, but like Algeria and Libya, it has lots of sunshine. And also, with its Atlantic coastline, they are developing wind power in a substantial, uh, to a substantial degree off the coast, uh, that is, offshore Morocco. There's also a European consortium called Desert Tech, which is developing solar power, in, solar power in North Africa. And if the Algerians and the Moroccans can start talking to each other, Desert Tech want to have solar panels in both of those countries. It's a particularly hot bit of border, if you can ignore the political geostrategy uh, link there. Desert Tech ret reckon if they put down solar panels roughly the same size as Connecticut, one of your smaller states, it would be enough to power all of North Africa and all of Europe, east and west. Now, the technology, of course, is imperfect to date. There's always the problem about how you move that electricity out of North Africa into Europe. And their claims, whilst not exaggerated, are based, I think, on an understanding of technological improvements in the years to come. But it's still a very, very teasing idea that solar energy could provide for all of Europe and North Africa. Um, time and technological developments will tell. In conclusion, I told you there was a link to the firm um, of shoes. It's a bit tenuous, but bear with me. The Green March shoes, Western Sahara. You'll allow me that one. The future of Morocco. These are the things to think about. These are our takeaway points. Western Sahara is obviously the biggest issue for Morocco. It's not domestic unemployment. It's not domestic unrest. Uh, it's, it's really decades of uncertainty over the position of Morocco vis-à-vis -vis Western Sahara and vice versa. To mangle my uh, Latin. This is the big problem. This is what's costing the country so much. And they really need to get it sorted. They need to get it sorted both for domestic political reasons and for regional integration. The Arab Maghreb Union, that moribund organization with the five-star flag, could be a powerhouse that could open up direct negotiations with the European Union, but not while Algeria and Morocco are not talking to each other. In terms of domestic business, fishing, tourism, and offshore oil and wind power are the things that Morocco needs to develop. The sealing wax... Yeah, OK, well, that's agreements with foreign powers. Again, a bit of a stretch, perhaps, but the verse was too good not to use it. Um, that long-standing relationship that, it, that Morocco has had with America since 1777 is not to be sniffed at. It's a very close relationship. If you look at a list of U.S. senators and congressmen who support Morocco's position vis-à-vis -vis Western Sahara, you will not find many dissenting voices. The Moroccans have a very good PR team at work in this country and in Europe. And that, I think, is one of the big stumbling blocks for the, the peoples of Western Sahara, is that American political establishment, so far as it cares at all, supports Morocco because it's seen as a stalwart, reliable ally, both against Islamist terrorism in North Africa and beyond. The reliance on phosphates is fine for Morocco for now. The economy will do very well, thank you very much. Whether or not that is the situation going forward, like 100 years from now, uh, these phosphates are going down. Obviously, it's a non-renewable source of energy. Um, I did read somewhere that Coca-Cola uh, have been looking at making their fizzy drinks uh, phosphate-free. Because believe it or not, there are phosphates in, in, in all sorts of forms of... I know, shocking, isn't it? In all of our food and drink. Um, I think the results for foodstuffs have been mixed. We've got rather used to the taste of phosphates in our, in our foodstuffs. And kings. Political legitimacy? Well, let's argue about that, shall we, in the seminar. For now, I'll leave you with the 